Peter's Anglican Church Berlin this Ash Wednesday. Today, Lent begins 40 days, a season of the Spirit, a season where we journey towards God and journey out in love towards our neighbours, towards our fellow human beings and fellow creatures who share life with us. Welcome to our service of worship. Our preacher tonight is Father Joachim, and our soloist this evening is Marie Chupin. Our organist is Laura Beebe. Welcome to this service of worship. Tonight, we are starting Lent with a service of light, a sign of the light of faith that we are reigniting in our hearts at the beginning of this season of Lent. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Hear our voice, O oh Lord, according to your faithful love. According to your judgment, give us life. Blessed are you, Lord God of our salvation. To you be glory and praise forever. In the darkness of our sin, you have shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Open our eyes to acknowledge your presence, that freed from the misery of sin and shame, we may grow into your likeness from glory to glory. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. with one heart and mind. As our evening prayer rises before you, O God, so may your mercy come upon us to cleanse our hearts and set us free to sing your praise now and forever. Amen. Have mercy on me, O God, in your great goodness. According to the abundance of your compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me thoroughly from my wickedness. And cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my faults. And my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned. And done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and righteous in your judgment. I have been wicked even from my birth, sinner when my mother conceived me. Behold, 
you desire truth deep within me and shall make me understand wisdom in the depths of my heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy of make me hear of joy and gladness. That the bones you have broken may rejoice. Turn your face from my sins. Blot out all my misdeeds. Make me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me again the joy of your salvation. And sustain me with your gracious spirit. Then shall I teach your ways to the wicked. And sinners shall return to you. Deliver me from my guilt, O God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth shall proclaim your praise. For you desire no sacrifice, else I would give it. You take no delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit. Broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fat beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who asks this from your hand? Trample my courts no more. Bring offerings in futile, incense in an abomination to me, new moon and Sabbath and calling of convocation. I cannot endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed festivals my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Le learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Come now. Let us argue it out, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. This is the word of the Lord.
A reading according to Luke. Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pots that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead, and his life again. He was lost, and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked, What was going on? He replied, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he got, has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and I have been have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Come, let us return to the Lord. For our God will richly pardon. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Saviour. He has looked with favour on his lowly servant. From this day forward, all generations shall call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him from generation to generation. Casting down the mighty from their thrones and lifting up the lowly. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel to remember his promise of mercy. This made to our ancestors, Abraham and his children. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, Come, let us return to the Lord. 
for our God will richly pardon. of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, Jesus is a great storyteller, and he always manages to hit the nail on the head. When Jesus presented the parable of the prodigal son, tax collectors and notorious sinners in the crowd drew near in order to hear what he had to say. And there were also Pharisees in the audience. In their wake, their watchdogs, the scribes. All of them come more or less with grumbling attitudes or critical hearts. The public sinners who wanted to hear what kind of wisdom the odd preaching carpenter could tell them, and of course the religious functionaries wishing to figure out what questionable or supposedly dangerous teaching he was going to proclaim today, to add more charges to their red list. In the end neither group takes him quite seriously. After all, he is only a carpenter from Nazareth, isn't he? Jesus masterfully crafted a story that addressed exactly what both the sinners and the pious needed to hear. The 15th chapter of Luke contains three separate stories, a shepherd with 100 sheep, who lost one, a housewife who lost a coin, and a father who lost his youngest son. The three parables, they all belong together. They form not only the compositional heart of Luke's Gospel, but also its theological center. For in Luke 15, Jesus sums up in three parables his entire self-understanding and ministry. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Of course, our today's Gospel reading on Ash Wednesday is about repentance, conversion and forgiveness that's obvious. But what else is it about? Let's put it that way. It is also about to get the short end of the stick, to go green with envy, and eventually it is about unconditional love. There was a man who had two sons, Jesus starts. There is no mention of a mother. So the man is a single parent, very wealthy. Considering the hygienic conditions of that time, it is not unreasonable to assume that his wife died in childbirth or shortly after. Thus, the grieving husband and father overcompensates for the loss of the beloved wife by directing all love and affection towards the youngest son. He is pampered, spoiled. 
And when, with the onset of puberty, the hormones start dancing the tango, he gets tired of the father's annoying social control and overprotective love. True, the father is not yet dead, but he doesn't care. For him, he has done his job and done his duty. And there's no need to get sentimental about that. So he has his inheritance paid out and ahead of time, not post, post, but pre-mortem. Why wasting time and wait so long? Even this absolute heartlessness, this childish egoism, this total cruelty towards, towards the father is accepted by the father without comment, without resistance, as if he were mesmerized. And so the young man leaves, far away, of course, very far away, abroad. For him, the father is already dead. He is no longer needed. But soon, then he can think, the money is gone, and his life is almost over, though it hasn't really begun yet. He will lang languish in some pig pen without a wife and without having started a family, without a livelihood and a career, and without his money, no one is interested in him. Nobody cares. And why should they? He is one human disaster, a total failure. Alfred Adler, the famous Jewish Austrian doctor and psychotherapist, studied especially the position of a person in the line of siblings. He characterizes a second child or the last child as follows. He knows a typical second child is very easy to recognize. It behaves, behaves as if it were taking part in a race. It always un, it's always under steam and wants to surpass the older sibling. Here we see the restless, a striving less for reality than for appearance, but indomitable until either the one in front is outdone or retreat begins after unsuccessful struggle. The mood of the second is envy. The feeling of being set back, not appreciated enough. Dear friends, in the end the father has to admit to himself that his son is unfit to live. Perhaps that is why he realizes that if he is not already dead, he will come back at some point. And so he waits, searches the horizon daily. And should he come back, then, of course, everything will be different. Then he will be set boundaries, no more being wrapped around his finger, no more being led around by the nose, be tough. Well, gosh, that's true, there's another son. We almost forgot about him. Interesting, isn't it? How much the spoiled brat holds our attention. It must have been a huge weight off the firstborn's mind when his younger brother ran away. At last, he will be the center of his father's attention again. About the firstborn, Alfred Adler writes, the firstborn is generally highly regarded, but it often happens that he is abruptly driven from his position. Another child is born and he is no longer unique. Adler calls this mortification a dethronement. 
and he has observed that even a year's distance from the afterborn sibling is enough quote, to make the traces of dethronement visible throughout life. The son who stayed at home seems to have rejoiced too soon. Although the younger brother was physically absent, nevertheless all the father's thoughts and feelings continue to revolve, to revolve worryingly, worryingly around the now absent son, his well-being and his welfare. From the firstborn's point of view, he continues to be ignored and unappreciated without attention, approval or recognition. To be overlooked, to be perceived only as an unproblematic functioning and sensible working eldest son that hurts. Finally, his neck bursts when the younger brother dares to come back torn and stinking and the father throws him a welcome party, but no one informs him about it. He has to find out for himself at the end of a hard day's work that people have been partying and stuffing their bellies in his absence. And this makes him even more furious, even more bitter, and in the end disrespectfully reproachful with biting criticism towards his father. They have simply forgotten about him. Dear friends, indeed the story of the prodigal son is about repentance and forgiveness. But it is also about the deep wound of not being seen enough, the feeling of falling short. Instagram, Facebook, YouTube and other social media live on people who finally want to get the attention they crave and who can measure their self-worth and recognition through followers' clicks and likes. Not being noticed, even ignored or rejected, not taken seriously, not seen, that triggers our old childhood experiences and traumas. It touches a deep wound that has not healed yet. Some then demand this attention aggressively and reproachfully in, the, in their current fam family, at work, in the church. Others withdraw bitterly, self-pityingly and ashamedly. Some insist Repro reproachfully on their good performance and how committed and involved they have always been in the congregation, their job, their relationship. Others no longer expect even attention or interest. They have given up on themselves. But dear friends, let's put it like that. When we try to develop and live a relationship with God and do not understand that we are not saved because of our good intentions, actions or our moral efforts, but that it is just a gift from God, just grace, if we do not understand that God loves us without merit and in spite of all sin and imperfection, then it is not a love relationship, but has to be a mercenary one. Basically, God cannot be a friend. God will be your boss. Now, when you are working for your employer, you are the employee and you might be friendly with your boss and he or she with you, but you know the fundamental nature of your relationship 
no matter how friendly you are or she or he is, it is a mercenary relationship. You have to do X, Y, Z and your boss has to pay X, Y, Z. If you don't do if X, Y, Z, no matter how friendly they are, they probably have to fire you. Even the boss likes you, but the upper boss is going to make you go. On the other hand, frankly, if you do X, Y, Z and your boss doesn't do X, Y, Z, then you have every right to quit. The bottom line relationship is a mercenary one. The person is your boss, not your friend. You are going to do your thing and you are going to expecting your benefits. And of course, if God doesn't come through and answers some of your prayers, you are going to say, where are my benefits? But basically, you are not friends. You are not loving because you've been loved. You are just doing because you've been done for. Unless we believe the gospel of grace, unless we have a deep understanding of Christ's life and death and teaching about who God is, we don't understand the nature of God. The 15th chapter of Luke contains three separate stories. A shepherd with 100 sheets, sheep who had lost one, a housewife who lost a coin, and a father who lost his youngest son. As we said, the three parables all belong together. For in Luke 15, Jesus sums up his entire self-understanding and ministry. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Most of Jesus' parable function like that of the lost sheep and the prodigal son, depicting extravagant or even outrageous behavior of love, which God shows to his children, pious or sinful alike. God is literally infatuated with us, like the Father in the parable. He waits longingly, even though the spoiled son has hurt him. He is constantly searching the horizon for you and me. We don't have to do anything or offer anything for him to notice or love us. We do not have to hide from him out of shame because of our sin. We do not have to be in competition with others for his attention. In this heart of Luke's Gospel, Jesus wants to encourage us this Ash Wednesday to change our attitude towards God, away from a mercenary relationship to a friendship, away from an employee or civil servant mentality to a relationship of deep affection. He is not our boss. He will be our friend. The 40 days of Lent can be a good time to start to practice this, to develop more and more this attitude, believe me, it will change all our lives as Christians. Amen.
Let us now call to mind our sin, our lostness, and the infinite mercy and grace and goodness of God. God the Father, have mercy on us. God the Son, have mercy on us. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. Trinity of love, have mercy on us. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We have not been forgiving to others in the way that we have been forgiven. Lord, have mercy. We've been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us. We've not been true to the mind of Christ. We've grieved your Holy Spirit. Lord, have mercy. We confess to you, Lord, all our past unfaithfulness, the pride, the hypocrisy, the impatience in our lives. Lord, have mercy. Our self-indulgent appetites and ways, our exploitation of people, animals and things. Lord, have mercy. Our anger, our frustration and our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves. Lord, have mercy. Our intemperate love of worldly goods and comforts and our little dishonesties in daily life and work. Lord, have mercy. Our laziness in prayer and worship. Our failure to commend the faith that is in us. Lord, have mercy. Accept our turning. Accept our repentance, Lord, for the wrongs we have done. For our blindness to human need and suffering. Our indifference to injustice and cruelty. Accept our repentance, Lord. For all false judgments, for uncharitable thoughts towards our neighbours, and for our prejudice and contempt towards those who are different from us. Accept our repentance, Lord. For our waste and pollution and misuse of your creation for our lack of concern for the generations who will come after us. Accept our repentance, Lord. Restore us, good Lord. Let your anger depart from us. Favourable, hear us, for your mercy is great. Accomplish in us the work of your salvation. That we may show your glory in the world. By the cross and passion of your Son. Bring us with all your saints to the joy of his resurrection. Therefore we confess. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen.
people, O oh God. That they may triumph over evil and bitterness, over envy and greed. That they may grow in grace. We pray to you, O oh Lord. For those who are learning about the Christian faith, the candidates for baptism and confirmation, for people of other faiths, for all people of goodwill, that this generation may learn to live by every word that proceeds from your mouth. We pray to you, O Lord. For the leaders of the nations, this nation and our home nations, that you will guide them in the ways of mercy and truth. We pray to you, O Lord, for the needy, that they may not be neglected or forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. We pray to you, O Lord, the sick in body, mind and spirit, that they may know your power to heal. Our congregation, we pray tonight for Margaret, for Scott, for Lavinia, for Jackie, those we know in need of God's healing touch in their lives this night. We pray to you, O Lord. For the poor in spirit, that they may inherit the kingdom of heaven and see you face to face. We pray to you, O Lord. So we commend the world, God's creation, for which Christ suffered, to the mercy and protection of our loving God. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Holy God, our lives are laid open before you. Rescue us from the chaos of sin. Through the death of your Son, bring us healing and make us whole. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Light in our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord. And by thy great mercy, defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As our Saviour himself has taught us. So, in the company of God's people across the world, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. May God, our Redeemer, show us compassion and love. Amen. Let us bless the Lord.